I'm Katherine Ferrara, and our guest tonight is Brian Lair. Brian Lair is a leading talk show host from WNYC, AM 820 and FM 93.9. Thank you for coming, Brian. Thank you, Katherine. This evening, we're going to be talking about Brian's keynote speech at the New York Law School Telecommunications Policy event that was held about two weeks ago. It was their 16th annual event, I believe. Um, the title was New Media, New Politics. But before we get into that, why don't you give us a little overview about your show and what it's about? Well, um, my show on WNYC, as you said, AMA 20 and 93.9 FM, is on weekday mornings from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, it's a live call in show, and we talk about issues in the news and life in New York. And we may be talking about um, the, uh, the bombings in Pakistan. One day, we may be talking about what the best public spaces are in New York um, the next day or the next hour. Uh, just about anything that deals with issues in the news, politics, a lot on the presidential race these days, and life in New York. It could be um, how hard it is to get into the uh, selective high schools in New York, or if you're a parent for your kids to get into the selective high schools and the rat race around that, or even uh, preschool, there's a rat race in New York. So we might be talking about that, or we might be talking about the war on terror. It sounds like you've hit a lot of different age groups and the concerns of many different people here in New York City and in New York in general. That's a good observation, because we do see the show as a community building show a community building exercise as well as news analysis. I generally say the show is about three things. Good information, honest debate, and community building. And because so much of the media, and you know, being uh, on a not-for-profit station, um, we have the luxury of not just being able to take one narrow demographic and having to sell to it, but to do things of interest to lots of different people and to help bring people together. You know, so much of talk radio is um, divided up by your point of view. So there's liberal talk radio, there's conservative talk radio, that kind of thing, mostly, mostly conservative talk radio. And so if you're not in agreement with the host, then you're seen as the enemy. So we don't do that. We're kind of the opposite of that, ceasefire instead of crossfire. Now, today, because we're talking about new media, why don't we go through first what we mean by that? New media is basically the digital world, the internet primarily. Mm -hmm. And the, the full title of the talk was A Million Little Murrows, New Media and New Politics. And by A Million Little Murrows, I'm referring to all the citizen journalists out there, the bloggers, the people who post their own videos on YouTube, the people who um, do uh, just even move things around, you know, forward things, email things. Uh, one of the most looked at features on the New York Times website now is the most emailed. So people want to know, it's kind of a self-generating list, because people want to know what is the most emailed article or, or top ten, right? So, so any of that is new media, and um, citizens have a different role to play in our democracy via this media than they did via old media let's say 50 years ago when Edward R. Murrow was taking on... I was just going to say, can we back sure. up and say who Edward Murrow was? He so was a... can explain what the title really means. A CBS news anchor in the 1950s and 60s, and back in the McCarthy days, Senator Joe McCarthy, witch hunts against all kinds of Americans who were seen as potentially communists, um, meaning who weren't uh, willing to give up their right to free speech in most cases or who weren't just avowedly conservative in the way that he was. Um, they were put on lists, some based on real political activity, some even based on fake political activity that McCarthy claimed that he had evidence of uh, for people in showbiz, people in all kinds of careers, certainly people in politics. And finally, he got brought down. You know, this was relatively near the beginning of the Cold War. Okay. And so people were um, afraid of the communists. They were afraid of the Soviets. 
And McCarthy was a demagogue. He played on people's fears. That's what a demagogue is, somebody who plays on people's fears, uses people's fears. And he, he did that. And finally, he got hoisted on his own petard. And one of the people responsible for doing that was the CBS News anchor, Edward R. Murrow, who spoke truth to power, who took on the powers that be of that time, particularly McCarthy, and did a real tough interview with him and kind of exposed him for the cowardly phony that he was. Uh, well, today, with new media, with citizen journalism, there are a million little Murrows out there doing their own exposés, doing their own research, and you don't have to wait for CBS News or something to either do it or not do it. Well, that brings me right into my next question for you. I know that there are two different groups of people out there. There are people who feel as though the Internet or Web 2.0 is going to hurt democracy. And then there are people who are for it, who believe it's an advantage, it's a benefit. It's going to allow the smaller groups to rise up and to communicate. Um, could you touch on, on both sides of that sure. just so that we can explain it to the audience? The, the basic arguments on the bad for democracy side are that um, Web 2.0 or, you know, and by Web 2.0, I mean Web 1.0 was just the existence of the Internet. You could go to websites and see them, or you could use email. Web 2.0 is this whole very interactive generation of the Web with a lot of people blogging, a lot of people... Social networking. Social networking, MySpace. Facebook, MySpace, um, YouTube, and forwarding things around, and et cetera. Um, so... One thing that that could produce that's negative is people dividing up into their own little worlds politically so that everybody who's liberal and wants to read um, liberal blogs that reinforce their own points of view on the world will go to Daily Coast, they'll go to Huffington Post, things like this, okay. and be in the echo chamber. Same thing with conservatives and some of so Some of the conservative to read the information that they're interested in. Right. So in that it. sense, it's the opposite of community building. It okay. it forces people to, you know, divide up into camps, their own little echo chambers, uh, and not really interact and see the world more in an us versus them way than than they did before. Um, there's there's also the sense by the critics that something is lost by having so many small media outlets so that in the days of, you know, people in the baby boom generation or older remember uh, when Kennedy was assassinated and all of America seemed to be watching, watching at that us. moment and in a way coming together over that, you know, horrible and in its way divisive um, act. And same thing with the moon landing in 1969. All of America seemed to be sitting around their televisions watching first man step foot on the moon. And there was the sense that there was a bit of social glue as a result of that. You know, when Walter Cronkite was delivering the news every night, Uncle Walter, and saying, that's the way it is. You know, people really believe. I mean, I don't even really believe that people believe that that's the way it was, but that's the mythology. Um, you know, but uh, but nostalgia is a powerful drug, uh, 